Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to the latest in this series of NR Time Roundtable discussions. And uh, this afternoon, we're focusing on the future of stroke care. I'm pleased to say we've got an absolutely formidable group of panellists with a wealth of experience and expertise, and uh, I'm really pleased to say that they're going to be sharing that with us over the course of the next hour or so. So I'd like to ask each of the panellists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about uh, themselves, their professional interests, their organisations or their areas of specific interest. So we'll kick off with uh, Zen, if that's okay, Zen. That's fine. Thanks, Celestia. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So my name is Zen Ko, so I'm from Singapore. So I am the um, co-founder and the um, global CEO of, of um, Foreign Intelligence. So I work with a team of um, passionate individuals. Um, so we are dedicated to reshaping the landscape of patient care and rehabilitation through um, healthcare robotics and AI-driven solutions. So over the course of my career, um, which spans over about um, two decades in the field of neural rehabilitation robotics, um, I have witnessed the transformative power of technology in healthcare. Um, so it all began when I served as a research fellow at the National University of Singapore. And since then, my journey has taken me to various startups and businesses, uh, businesses in Singapore, Switzerland, and China. So each step of the way, my focus has always been on providing medical devices healthcare solutions and services for people with disabilities and neurological conditions. Um, so we, we aim to impact lives on a global scale. So I have had also the privilege of wearing multiple hats in the field of healthcare and rehabilitation. So I am currently serving as the president and ambassador of the International Industry Society for the Advanced Rehabilitation Technology, also known as ISAT. So um, we basically represent the forefront of cutting edge research and technology in healthcare. Um, so additionally, I also serve as the general chair for the Rehab Week 2023, um, a conference and exhibition that will be hosted for the very first time in an Asian country, Singapore. So I want to take the opportunity to invite all of you to join us in Singapore uh, this coming September on the 24th. Um, so this will be an opportunity for us to showcase the latest advancement in rehab technology and also foster collaborations globally that will drive uh, further innovations for rehab and healthcare. Um, I also serve and got myself involved as the executive director of the Swiss Space Motors Academy, uh, an association that um, actually allows me to contribute to the advancement of uh, new rehabilitation technology through knowledge sharing. Um, so. I also serve as a role as a managing editor for a journal known as uh, JRMT, the Journal for Rehabilitation Matters and Technologies. Um, so we use that to disseminate crucial research and knowledge uh, globally. So the organization that I'm, I'm fronting now for Intelligent um, has witnessed remarkable growth. So over the past years, we have secured significant financing round from renowned investors, such as the um, Saudi Aramco Prosperity 7 Venture, SoftBank Vision Fund 2, so we, we are basically working on driving change and positively impacting patients' lives across the globe. So yeah, so very brief introduction about myself. So I'm very optimistic about the future of healthcare technology and stroke care. Um, so I think our journey so far has been incredible. So I believe that the potential of robotics and AI in healthcare is boundless. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us, Zen, and for the invitation to your conference. Uh, if we could come to you next, Sarah, please. Oh, hi, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Sarah. So I'm a background of a physiotherapist, and I'm a clinical lead over at Askin Rehab, um, which is part of Askin Village Community in Doddington. Um, we're a neuro environment, so we provide rehabilitation at that level two specialist nursing level um, for residents um, in for multiple areas, so Cambridgeshire, Suffolk, Norfolk, throughout the UK. Um, we look, we're very keen on innovation, um, so we do use robotic therapy, we have aquatic therapy, um, we have VR and we use FES to, as all the adjuncts for rehabilitation and and to get the best out of 
that opportunity for those residents. Um, so my special, my particular interest is in robotic therapy. Great. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, Jacko. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacko Browers. I um, uh, I'm a Dutch physiotherapist working in uh, in the UK. Uh, trained in the Netherlands. Uh, before training as a physio, I trained as a ship's engineer. So engineering and technology is uh, kind of a, a hobby of me. Um, and uh, um, whilst in the UK, I specialized in neurosciences uh, rehabilitation and um, was then the, uh, the therapy lead for neurosciences for Wales uh, for 12 years. Uh, that included site responsibility for specialist rehabilitation services in Wales, that is spinal cord injury, brain injury, stroke, uh, community brain injury teams, etc. Um, and then I progressed into senior management. Um, I did some uh, uh, some performance management for the health board, seven hospitals, uh, but also wider in Wales, uh, digitizing health records, etc. Um, because I wanted to keep a finger in uh, as a physiotherapist, I started Morello uh, mainly because I wanted to bring technology closer to the patients and try and bridge that gap from emerging technologies. Um, so our aim initially was to educate people to uh, either purchase or hire equipment and then bring it to people to educate clinicians and patients. Um, and along the way, um, we've been asked to provide rehabilitation for people using that same technology. So uh, as, a, as an end result at the moment, Morello is a technology rich rehabilitation environment. Um, it is an outpatient and community based service um, with the only uh, service in Wales to be part of the INPA, the Independent Neuro Providers Alliance, and we're very proud to be uh, one of the few community services that have managed to get into the INPA. Um, at Morello, we provide a lot of uh, FES-related products, so we do a lot of stimulation. Um, we also have um, some robotic assistance in some of our um, uh, equipment. And um, we're looking to enhance the sensory feedback or the, um, the augmented feedback element uh, of our service. Um, a lot of people are working with virtual reality, and I think that it's the augmented feedback opportunities that virtual reality gives that makes it exciting rather than the virtual reality itself. Um, we are currently busy with uh, Stroll, where we have a headset technology. Um, and uh, later today, we're trying out NeuroSkin, uh, which is a suit uh, that had sensors built in, but also FES uh, built in. Um, we have had experience with exoskeletons, but the price of it doesn't allow us as a, uh, as a small uh, practice to, uh, to purchase it. So we normally hire it and bring it in if there are people who are interested. Um, next to my clinical work, I've been the chair of the Neurophysiotherapy Association in the UK. Um, and managed that uh, organization for six years from uh, just a group of people who are interested in neurology to an organization that has three and a half thousand members in the UK and uh, is now a registered charity. Um, so that, uh, that's me, Yako Zen. I'm looking forward to meet you in September because I've already got my ticket booked. Thanks for that, Jacko. Uh, Liz, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Dr. Liz Iveson. I'm a, my background is in stroke and neurorehabilitation, and I'm a, I've been a consultant now in stroke medicine, particularly since 2006. Um, but I've been interested in stroke care from 1996 when my granddad had a stroke when I was a fourth year medical student and was cared for on a gastroenterology ward with discussions about nasogastric feeding and DNR standing up in a corridor. Um, and he had no rehab options offered following his stroke. Um, and at that time, I thought, well, I can do better than this. But it was an era where stroke patients were basically put into a bed and left in A&E last. Um, and, you know, um, and, and so but since so I so I and there wasn't stroke medicine as a specialty. So I trained in general medicine and elderly medicine um, and did a stroke fellowship research for two years, um, a mixture between King's College London and Jamaica for 18 months looking into um, why strokes more common in Caucasians compared to, in Africa, beans compared to Caucasians um, and a Wellcome Trust product 
um, project and then um, got a stroke job in York in 2006, which was just at the time where stroke was becoming its own specialty. Um, at that time, we didn't have an acute stroke unit, so we, we set up one and um, set up the thrombolysis service, which again needed a lot of persuasion doing a one and two rotor initially, um, myself and a colleague, just to get it off the ground. Um, and, you know, the, the progress in particularly acute and hyperacute stroke care has been absolutely incredible to see over the last, um, you know, 10, 15, 10, 15 years. Um, I've also, I've also uh, was the chair of the Yorkshire Stroke Research Network and then the um, Yorkshire and Humber stroke lead for research when they became into the CRNs um, and then certainly over the last few years I've moved more from the acute stroke care um, into I've always had an interest in rehabilitation and um, I've been head of clinical lead of the rehab ward in York but the last few years um, have moved more into community and um, more into the private sector from a longer term neuro rehabilitation point of view, because my interest is very much in the longer term neuro rehab of, of stroke patients and patients with brain injury, spasticity management, and um, all of the robotic side and, and the sort of advancing technologies that you've all discussed. Um, and one of my big passions is um, I've, I've had the opportunity to be clinical lead in the community for an integrated care team and clinical lead at two neuro rehabilitation units um, and I currently work at STEPS Neuro Rehab in Sheffield um, and which I know are working with yourselves then um, as well as doing some treating consultant work and some spasticity management um, for outpatients and one of the biggest challenges I see is how to um, is the lack is the discrepancy between what's offered within the private sector and what's available on the NHS for patients that don't fit the box. Um, so the hyperacute stroke care, I think, is, is set up. There are obviously challenges within the hyperacute stroke care world and the acute, acute care um, in the hospitals. But I think one of the biggest challenges that faces is that there's so many patients that are left with disability that need really specialist neuro rehabilitation that don't necessarily fit in that three month um, post stroke rehabilitation box where you do get access to NHS and early supported discharge teams and, and stroke care um, and and there's so much going on outside you know within the private sector mainly that actually when I was working predominantly within the NHS as a consultant I had no idea what was you know that this was available and there are there are things are moving improving but I do think particularly in stroke and um, the access to psychology and access to some of these technologies is just significantly lacking and also just basic community rehab again is, is significantly lacking unless you have the funds to pay for it yourself um, so I think that's one of the biggest challenges for me but my, my interest is very much in holistic care of patients and looking at the whole person longer term management of complex problems and spasticity management. Thanks, Liz. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those themes as the discussion unfolds. Uh, and last but not least, Sanjeev, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, thank you for the invite. My name is Sanjeev Nayak. I'm an interventional neuroradiologist at the Royal Stoke University Hospital. Um, I, the, you know, the, uh, my passion is thrombectomy. Uh, we pioneered the first 24-7 thrombectomy, stroke thrombectomy center in the UK in our, at Stoke-on-Trent. Um, since then, we have treated more than 1,000 patients, and we have expanded the service to our region, which is, um, you know, across Shropshire and Cheshire and, um, you know, Wolverhampton. And we treat more, uh, we see around 3.5 million stroke patients in our catchment. Uh, following this, um, uh, you know, following uh, developing this first 24-7 service, I've also been actively campaigning for this to be available throughout the country throughout the country as you understand most of the thrombectomy is available on a postcode lottery basis at the moment with many centers not offering only offering nine to five and some um, you know very few centers offering 20 on you know this service on a 24 7 basis um, um, if you look at the statistics from the stroke association uh, only 3.3 percent of the patients the eligible patients are receiving thrombectomy in the UK and uh, last year, more than around 7,000 patients have missed out on this treatment. So this is where I've been passionate about to kind of make raise awareness 
to make sure that you know we get the adequate resources the the centers do get adequate resources and the funds uh, to uh, you know kind of uh, develop this life saving and game changing uh, uh, treatment Thanks very much, Sanjeev. Uh, Liz, you touched on a number of issues there, but I, I, I'd like to sort of dig a bit more deeply. And Zain, maybe we could start with you. Could you say something about what you see as the major issues, the major trends, the major opportunities with reference to the future of stroke care? Sure. So I think as we continue our exploration of the future of stroke care um, and untapped potential of robotics, um, we have to look into numerous opportunities and challenges. Um, so I want to outline maybe four opportunities and um, potential challenges and barriers um, that we have witnessed along um, our journey. Um, so I think the first opportunity is the possibility for us to um, continuously monitoring and and using uh, data-driven insights to actually uh, monitor stroke patients. So using robotics and AI, we can enable this continuous uh, progress of monitoring and providing real-time data on their physical and cognitive abilities. So this wealth of information can be, can be used to gain valuable insights into the effectiveness of rehabilitation interventions and then help us to uh, tailor treatment plans accordingly. So as we embrace data-driven decision-making, stroke care can become more evidence-based and result-oriented. So the second opportunity that we, we, we actually identified would be using assistive robotics for ADL or activities, activities of daily living. So beyond traditional rehabilitation sessions, robotics can significantly assist our stroke survivors with their activities of daily living. So examples such as like, you know, um, Robotic exoskeletons and wearable devices can aid in walking and to help patients grip objects and perform other tasks. So empowering stroke patients to regain independence and engage, engage in um, daily routines more efficiently. So the third opportunity is um, basically using um, VR, virtual reality, and the gamification of functional training. So by integrating um, VR and gamification into stroke rehab, we can make the recovery process more engaging and enjoyable. So by turning therapy sessions into interactive and immersive experience, stroke survivors are more likely to remain motivated and committed to their treatment. So thereby leading to improved clinical outcomes. Um, the fourth opportunity is uh, to be uh, remote consultations and expert collaborations using robotics. So we can use technology to facilitate this uh, remote consultation between stroke patients and healthcare professionals so including like, you know, um, rehabilitation specialists, they can engage and interact with their patients. Uh, so through telemedicines and robotic telepresence, um, stroke survivors uh, in underserved particularly areas can assess expert advice and guidance, reducing disparities in care and improving overall stroke outcomes. I want to outline four barriers or challenges um, that we have witnessed along the way. Um, the first, I think a lot of us have actually um, been through that, is the user acceptance and adoptions. So introducing all, any kind of technology, robotic or AI into stroke care, may face initial resistance from patients, caregivers, and even healthcare providers due to concerns about unfamiliar technology or perceived loss of human touch. So overcoming this barrier, barrier requires effective communication education and demonstration of robotic benefit to stroke rehabilitation. So we are doing that uh, through ISAT and Motosecademy. The second challenges uh, that we have identified will be the interoperability and integrations of technology. So integrating robotic and AI into assisting healthcare systems and workers can be challenging. So we have to ensure that there's a seamless interoperability between robotic devices and electronic health records. But this is essential to avoid disruptions in care delivery and enhance the overall efficiency of stroke rehabilitation. Uh, the third being the ethical and legal considerations. So as robotics and AI become more prevalent in stroke care, um, ethical and legal considerations regarding data privacy, patient autonomy, and liability become paramount. So we have to establish balance 
between innovation and safeguarding patients' rights. And this is crucial to building trust in adopted, adoption of these technologies. And last but not least, the resource allocation and the cost effectiveness. So while robotics offers immense potential for scope care, uh, cost, <laughs> cost considerations are always uh, little widespread adoption. So healthcare facilities must weigh in uh, the long-term benefits of the population outcomes against the initial investment in robotics and AI technologies. So demonstrating cost effectiveness and putting the value of these innovations will be crucial to actually uh, run a support and investment. Yeah. So these are some of the opportunities and barriers that we have identified in our journey. That's uh, that's really helpful, Zen. Uh, that's quite uh, quite a list for us to get our teeth into. Uh, Sarah, uh, I'm afraid this is probably going to be one of these situations where if you're last here, we may have run out of issues and opportunities. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, Sarah, any thoughts on either what Zen's got to say or your own feelings about uh, the big issues, trends and opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, you know, being a physiotherapist, I come from a very probably different background in terms of being on the ground and what we can actually offer. You know, we know the new straight guidelines have just been recently published and they clearly highlight if you've got motor recovery, you know, goals and um, potential that, you know, you should be looking at three hours of that therapy input a day, you know, five out to seven days. And that's great. And I absolutely agree with that. But one of those limitations are who's staffing that? You know, where are those trained staff coming from? Um, you know, we all know, I'm sure everyone on this table knows that trying to recruit at the moment those qualified members of staff is incredibly difficult. So, and I, I mean, I am a very much an innovative and, and tech physio. I love my tech. I love my robotics. You know, I love my FES and I love my VR. That's absolutely brilliant. But you need those experienced staff members to be trained in those areas and be able to give those residents, those patients, those opportunities. And that shouldn't just be in the private, you know, Dr. Ibsen, you know, you made a really valid point that actually that's wonderful. That's all out there in the private opportunity. But what about those that can't afford that? You know, you know, there are the majority of public out there that cannot afford that private opportunity. You know, private therapy is expensive. The robotics are expensive. Um, you know, we're not talking a few thousand. We, you know, some of them are hundreds of thousands. You know, and actually, do the NHS have that opportunity to fund those? You know, should it be those that can afford it are the only ones that, are, you know, have that opportunity to have that exposure? Again, we all know around this table that we should be tapping into neuroplasticity very, very early on in that recovery phase. You know, from a physiotherapist's point of view, I should be doing three to 400 repetitions of a particular movement to provide that neuroplasticity to get that motor recovery. And, you know, as a physio, you know, I can't provide that in one session. If I said to you, right, you're going to come and do 300 squats, I'm sure all of you would say, absolutely no way. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do 300 squats. Um, and so we need to do it in a different way. And that's where the robotic therapy comes in. And that's where you can have that same repetition. It's exactly the same. It doesn't matter which user uses it. It's the same repetition every time. Um, and that's where we are definitely seeing the, the great outcomes. Um, and, you know, and like Jacko was saying, you know, in his conversation earlier um it's not just about that motor relearning it's about also putting it into a functional pattern um so giving them that whole opportunity and again that just provides different challenges you know from a staffing perspective from a funding perspective you know i, I don't know around your areas our areas are very much they get initially funded for eight weeks of therapy now who can really rehab a stroke in eight weeks now, yes, that's from an inpatient setting and, you know, that's predominantly what, you know, what I look at, you know, the residents that I look after. But it's at an opportunity in the community for them to have that ongoing therapy. Community staffing is 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 limited. And I think it's that opportunity. That's the biggest challenge for me is funding those experienced staff members to provide that optimal therapy um, at optimum period where they have the opportunity to recover. Great, thanks Sarah. Uh, your perspective on uh, some of what you've heard, Jacko, or your own view on uh, the big issues? 
Um, yes, uh, uh, thank you. I, I very much uh, um, agree there, Sarah, that um, um, the technology is there to, to help us in our rehabilitation. I think it brings the challenges like uh, Zen already identified. Um, I, I think the, the biggest challenge to adopt uh, technology uh, is, is going to be the cost. Um, the cost because the technology allows you to be more intensive um, but the current rehabilitation isn't intensive so you first of all have to have to uh, find a method by which you're gonna uh, intensify the rehabilitation provision I think it's what Sarah is identifying the staffing element there is going to be really difficult to uh, to overcome so in terms of your know, challenges for the future I think that's a big challenge um, and then the, the, uh, the, the intensity of the rehabilitation that is uh, historically provided isn't really where the evidence is pointing. So to drive that neuroplasticity, we need to be more intense. Uh, we, need to, we need to go those, uh, um, uh, find ways of, of getting those repetitions up, even in, in the home of the patient, because it shouldn't stop uh, when people leave hospital, when people leave that acute or that subacute rehabilitation facility. They need to continue with their rehabilitation even when they're at home. And I think that, that is where there is a great opportunity in terms of technology, uh, because you can instruct people to work with a piece of technology, you can monitor their, uh, their performance remotely, um, and you can uh, perhaps help them to create the environment at home that is intensive. And it isn't a relaxation going home and doing nothing. But it, the, the opportunity is there to instruct people during uh, an inpatient or an, or community rehabilitation uh, period that is a statutory rehabilitation period to instruct them and to train them and to teach them in how to manage their condition and how to keep reaping the benefits of ongoing rehabilitation. Um, and it's, it's skill learning after all. So they, they have to be adjusted, adapted um, and kept interested. Um, you know, the, the Sarah identified this um, uh, do, doing uh, 300 squats uh, yeah nobody's going to want to do 300 squats but uh, yesterday I had one of my stroke patients on the treadmill on our augmented feedback treadmill which projects um, uh, items on the belt um, and um, she she's been doing uh, 400 steps at home when she walks between the kitchen and the lounge and the toilets and that's it uh, yesterday just in one treadmill session she did 1200 steps um, so she wasn't thinking about uh, about oh I'm doing so many steps. It was engaging. The virtual environment is helping her to uh, to identify targets. She was really concentrating hard. All of those elements are the elements that we need for neuroplasticity and to drive it. So I think that technology is a um, is is one of those elements that can help us to achieve the intensity and the engagement at the right level of the patient. Uh, however, I think the cost is going to be um, the the factor that's going to going to limit uh, deployment of technology quickly into the traditional rehabilitation environments. Thanks, Jacko. And I'm sure we'll come back to talk about technology and maybe some of the specifics that, that Zen mentioned. Liz, from your perspective, the big sort of issues and opportunities, it'd be great if you could maybe touch on uh, access to care as well, which uh, I, I think you remarked on during your introduction as well, and the degree to which that's very mixed awareness and access amongst the, the patient community yeah i think i think my, my i think the biggest challenge that i can see is across is how to get the stroke pathway working for all the patients and as sadjeeva said it, you know it is a postcode lottery still and that's a postcode lottery for hyperacute stroke care um plus all, all the way from the initial you know tia it's stroke presentation right down through the through to community rehabilitation um, and as well as as well as just being a postcode lottery of what's actually available there's also um, a significant lack of education it depends whether you've got a relative that's fighting for you or you know whether you've got an advocate that's pushing for you or or you know whether if it hasn't affected your cognitive side so much you're pushing for yourself um, as to get it to be able to get access to sort of the more longer term neuro rehab, um, but I think it's a, it's a wider problem, and it's well, it's one that's going to be very difficult to solve. But the 
the stroke pathway in general needs to be you know right for that patient so it needs to be right from the very start because if we can get more you know thrombectomies for you know it, it can be more consistent from a hyperacute stroke care and get that part right then obviously there's going to be less people that are disabled following a stroke so there's to me there's this this it's starting from and even before that in the you know the lifestyle primary prevention um or, or, you know lots of the lots of the um sort of preventative measures and and really an education regarding TIA and, and what a stroke is, blood pressure ma management, obesity. So this real front end stuff, even before people actually present with the strokes. And then I think the next challenge is obviously getting access for the patients to the, the hyperacute stroke and the immediate care that they need that we know helps preserve, preserve as much neurons as, as possible and, and tries to you know limit the amount of disability. But then there is this recognition, and this is what I see a lot and what I have seen throughout you know working in the NHS for 25 years is that rehabilitation does tend to be the sort of poor man's specialty so it tends to be the area that is less funded it attracts less sort of interest from management I, I've put I put four business cases together before I actually got an agreement for an early supported discharge team and within that the psychology was out speech and language therapy is woefully lacking um, and you know the concept of um, and intensity on the ward again as, as Sarah said it, you know this the staffing just wasn't there and and one way of getting intensity on a rehab ward is, is, is that, as as we've all recognized is the use of technology um you know because certainly patients that you know it does increase the amount of repetition but also patients have to be ready for that rehab and again um this because of the lack of beds and because of the thoroughfare of people coming through the hospital what we are finding is that people don't stay in hospital as long so they so they so they while they're in hospital they do get access to specialist care and then they tend to be you know out into the community and then that becomes an absolute minefield so in some areas the community rehabilitation is good but still from an intensity wise it's it's woefully inadequate and um, and patients do have to sort of often top up their rehab um, if they even know how to top up their rehab, which a lot of people don't know what they need. But there's also the other issue is some patients, when when they are discharged, um, uh, at the time they're not ready for the rehab. You know, they're, they're fatigued, you know, particularly the posterior circulation strokes often can't, can't do a lot of rehab in the first few months because they're so tired. You know, often there's other problems like... Um, depression and pain which and spasticity which again are not very well managed generally so i think it's it's how do we sort of actively manage lots of these problems and and get the right rehab at the right time for the patients and some patients again will embrace technology and others will need a bit more gently nudging in, into it um but, but i do i do think it's getting a lot of the basics right that that we're way way behind at the moment in the uk um, and um, the way that the stroke funding has been tied up, it, 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 the commissioners, it's, it's very hard to get um, long term, neuro, longer term neuro rehabilitation for some of my younger stroke patients, for example, that maybe have non dominant hemisphere strokes that need the more subtle type of cognitive rehab um, funded. Um, because the, the, the thing that keeps coming back is, well, it's you know you've, you've got funding already and 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 there's, there's there's certain types of stroke patients that again don't get particularly good um neuro rehab funded in the community particularly like subarachnoid hemorrhages there's a bit of a gap in in that who who they're looked after by so that there's lots of gaps um uh, and, but there's lots of really, really great stuff going on and, and there's lots of progress in particularly sort of the, the, the rehabilitation side and how to sort of, uh, you know, get the most out of that person and really optimise their quality of life and their potential. But we all know that a lot of it is, is about intensity and it's about giving the rehab at the right time. Um, and it's also not labelling people as no, having no rehab potential which is the bane of my life as well is this this it's how to sort of challenge this thinking and and um boundaries that i think we put on our patients um as clinicians based on either historical things or what is what is available because if you know that somebody there isn't the community rehab for example after three months or eight weeks it, it, that 
it shapes, I think it can shape people how they talk to patients and their narrative. And there's lots of great work coming out, um, you know, from Nick Ward, particularly at Queen Square with the Upper Limb Rehab Programme, with where he, you know, is evidence that, you know, an intensive Upper Limb Rehab Programme can can produce, um, you know, improvements in function and, um, and, and, you know, range of movement and activity years after stroke and and i'm seeing this a lot at steps you know we have patients that come in you know many years after stroke who actually need a lot of areas optimizing like spasticity like pain management like mood but then with the addition of the the robotics and in intensity they actually are are still improving and again it's how to challenge some of this thinking but also how to act how to get access for it and, and also get access for it at the right time for the right patients as well um and uh, and i think that, that there's a lot of challenges but it's getting the whole pathway right really um for me which is a very big challenge i think within stroke care at the moment due to many of the issues that have been raised you know including resources and uh, funded as, as a two of the main things as well plus education thanks liz uh, sanjeev your thoughts yeah, I mean, I want to make, um, you know, I want to raise one particular point. The mindset has to change firstly. Um, the, the, you know, the, the stroke care has significantly progressed over the years. Now, if you look at it with thrombectomy, it's pretty much like, you know, it's like putting a button on from a patient who is significantly disabled to going home next day. So that mindset hasn't changed yet. People still believe that stroke is something which is uncurable and the funding, if you look at stroke compared to some of the other treatments which are available at the moment, for example, you know, if you look at the, uh, the funding for stroke when compared to can, you know, cancer and uh, maternity, it's, 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 it's significantly less. There should be more investment into, um, you know, into uh, acute stroke care, especially also in prevention areas of prevention and rehabilitation. But that's not happening. The, the funding is so low. We are struggling at the moment. Even despite providing for nearly a decade this 24/7 service, we're still providing, uh, we're still struggling getting the, uh, you know, a second uh, angiographic suite or a biplane suite for our, you know, to run this service for a wider population. We don't have, we're struggling to get the kind of funding for the staff. So that mindset hasn't changed as yet, and there's a lot of promises being made. If you look at the, um, uh, you know, the the long-term plan for 2022, it, the plan was to hit the target for thrombectomy, but I think only 2.2% target was met. So they failed in that. So there is, needs to be more serious look into how they can actually improve this. I think one of the ways I feel strongly is investment. There should be more investment in stroke as a whole, not just the acute, definitely yes for the acute stroke, but the whole pathway. And also I do not know, I think Liz may be able to say a bit more about this. What's the situation now with the ISDNs and the ISB, you know, into, you know, ICBs? I don't know if there is any much kind of, um, you know, uh, support for them. Uh, if, I, if there's any much link between the ICBs and the ISDNs and if there is a way, you know, they can, can kind of get more funding for their particular regions. For example, things have progressed. AI has come in now for stroke, as, as you know. There's more use of AI for diagnosing and for which will help in treatment as well. Still, the awareness is, I feel there's a lack of awareness everywhere of all these newer changes, newer things which are there. So that's something, there has to be a campaign, a strong campaign. Number one, I think the few things to do, if I, if I had a district, I would say one is a, a, a strong, uh, what do you call, uh, awareness campaign, throughout which it should be involving not just the people within the stroke pathway, but also we need to make the politicians and other individuals who are involved in the funding aware of this. One is awareness campaign. Secondly, there should be a strong drive or some form of initiative to uh, raise more, uh, you know, more funding towards stroke as a whole. And also look at pathways, how the thrombectomy can work properly, for example, because I'm, that's my area of expertise, how, um, you know, uh, various uh, regions or various, uh, you know, individuals within the region can work together to see uh, a wider area can be covered for those areas which do not offer the service. So a lot of work which can, which needs to be done. And one of the ways this can happen is by getting a lot of people together in a single room from multiple specialities and having a frank discussion as to what exactly can be done to improve this, um, this, you know, these things. So I think this is just a start. I think one of the things this seminar is useful, you know, kind of this uh, meeting. 
to have these kind of meetings to um, brainstorm and to have more and more uh, individuals from various um, you know various um, um, I, would, I would say various um, uh, not just the specialities from various groups for example stroke association um, politicians you know from people from ICBs ICDNs I, you know ISDNs and uh, you know I, uh, royal colleges all these people can get together and see how things can be worked out what are the areas which are uh, where the gaps are and how these gaps can be addressed that's my that's, that's what i'm saying at this stage mm -hmm. i just can i just comment I, I i was just gonna say i completely agree with you um and i think one of the one of the frustrating things which has been since 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 the first papers on thrombolysis were, were published really was was this recognition that actually um if you fund the front end then then um you know you will save money down the line but i think because of this structure of how things are set out in in england particularly from a funding perspective and it's all very disjointed isn't it you know you've got your your primary you know your your hospitals in one bubble you've got your community in one bubble and you've got your social care in another bubble and and it's it's about you know the the economic argument there's a very strong economic argument as, as you well know about for thrombectomy and thrombolysis and hyperacute stroke care and and you know and how you know you reduce the the, the um you know the, the cost of looking after somebody and, and providing you know 24-hour care or you know however, whatever whatever level of care they need further down the line and again that's the same with neuro rehab if you can if you can rehabilitate someone early and and improve their function and improve their independence and you know potentially get them out back to work or you, you know it, it, it's it's it, it keeps society going but again that's that doesn't seem to be factored into a lot of the arguments that are, are put forward from a, from a from funding of stroke care. And I think a lot of it is because it is so disjointed um, and the pots of money are so separate still. Um, and, and and that's been a challenge, I mean, since, well, uh, I mean, 2006, I mean, it, you know, that, uh, and, and, you know, I can remember arguing for lots of different things, but it's, and, and funding, and you know, when we tried to set up the thrombolysis road to, I, I agree with you, this, it, it, I, I don't understand why stroke isn't, looked at and and in the same category as as uh, you know heart attacks and and you know and eyes and um and and cancer because it affects so many people um and it, but it, it it still isn't it still isn't it still doesn't seem to have the same wave behind it and and I, i've always thought certainly up till maybe 10 years ago i always thought some of that was because a lot of the you know physicians and and clinicians that are interested in stroke looking after stroke patients gen generally came from elderly medicine or rehab medicine or you know the, the allied health professionals physiotherapy occupational therapy and and generally the, the type of person that goes into stroke care traditionally is, is isn't that sort of traditional you know banging on the door of everybody asking for funding and and you know getting together and raising you know really I, I, I don't know how to put, put it, but it, 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 you know there, there are certain there are certain fields in in medicine that attract you know people that are really you know out there banging on the doors, really getting funding um, for their specialty. And I think I think we as stroke in the stroke community need to step up and 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 I agree, get together and and really start start making more of a noise about this because it is woefully underfunded and. And as you say, I don't think people and the education generally is just not there. And and you, even the, within the public, I mean, I don't don't think the public know all that can be done, particularly in the hyperacute setting. But also, as you say, you know, once you've had your stroke, if you if you are left with some level of disability, you know, the recovery potential that you have with the right intensity at the right time um, is is you know you, you, people can go in two different directions depending on what they get offered yeah. and, and that is sad to see um and people do extremely well but also i do see a lot of people that haven't been offered um rehab or the care that they need um and potentially haven't as much potential because of that yeah. thanks liz uh, zane I, I mean you've got a global perspective uh at, at 
We've talked quite a lot about the UK uh, and the pathways that Liz talks about to improve outcomes and maybe equalise outcomes and access as well. Are there global examples of where that's working more effectively? Right. Um, I agree with all the speakers, you know, um, I think um, Liz, Sarah and Jocko and also Sanjit mentioned some very good points. Um, so globally, we are facing similar problems as well. Um, so therefore, I think Sanjit mentioned that I work with different societies and interest groups to actually promote our cause. And I think, um, uh, you know, Liz and Jocko also mentioned about the cost of implementing technologies. Sarah mentioned about like, you know, um, how do we ensure that, you know, our patients get enough intensive and dosage and repetitions. And, you know, for new rehab, it's important that patients start early. That when the brain is really plastic, we get more better outcomes. So we work with various groups, uh, particularly five major stakeholder groups. Uh, first being the caregivers and the, uh, the end users. So the caregiver and the end users need to know that there are such technologies available so they can reverse, you know, influence the clinicians or even the healthcare facilities to consider using and adopting technologies. The second group being the clinicians, the doctors, you know, um, um, the, the, the therapists, they need to adopt, accept and embrace technology. So um, some, some, some therapies at the initial um, years when I started my career, they are what we call technophobia. They didn't want to use technology, not because it is not effective. It is because they, they don't know how to use it. They do, they do not want to spend time or they, they, do, they do not want to look back in front of the, the patients. The third group, um, the third group being the, the engineers, the researchers, the scientists um, in the universities or in the, in, in the companies, they need to know that, you know, working together, we can lower the cost of um, inventing or, you know, commercializing or, you know, productized technologies. The fourth group being the, um, the, the policy makers and the, um, maybe the hospital management, the, the government official, the MOH, you know, ministers or, or officials. They didn't know that such technologies exist and work out some kind of policies to, to ensure that, you know, um, healthcare facilities or hospitals or clinicians can, can actually have the, the, the ability to adopt and actually uh, purchase these technologies. Last but not least will be the, um, what we call the, the companies like us. You know, we need to work with um, these stakeholder groups to actually commercialize technologies that make sense. So I'm an engineer, right? So if you let me work myself in lab, I will create something that maybe clinicians like Lise and Sarah will refuse to use. <laughs> so we had to work with you guys, embrace your, 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 your clinical know-how to actually create technologies that can be clinically relevant. So globally, we are, we are, we are seeing um, um, wide acceptance of technology. I think that there are no doubts now that technologies will be the future in healthcare setting and rehab. Um, I, I think that the, the, the next step forward is how do we create a, an ecosystem or platform where technologies can be um, affordable, accessible. So what Fourier try to do is that um, we try to create a platform or ecosystem of technology we call the rehab hub. Um, so if I may just take a minute to quickly explain what it's all about. If I may use an example, it is like, you know, the last 20 years, we have, we have, we have witnessed like, you know, um, hundreds of companies um, spinning off from universities and clinics with really good ideas. One single product, one single ideas, maybe from Jekyll, from, 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 from Sarah, from Lee's, from the clinics, and they start companies, really good technologies. But three to five years later, they're gone. So we see that a lot over the last 20 years of my career. What happened is because a single product companies um, struggle to survive um, because we are facing a very challenging economic um, situation. You cannot have economy of scale. And also for the clinicians, they find it difficult to adopt as well. It is like, you know, at least trying to buy a, a computer. Instead of buying a, a computer or laptop, she go and buy a, lap, a, a keyboard, a mouse, a CPU, and monitor, and try to assemble herself and then program the OS herself. I mean, this is actually what happened in the clinical setting. So Sarah will be buying like from 10 companies and trying to integrate it. And then the data are not interchangeable and she, she's try, struggling to do the clinical integration part of the work. So for it, try to create an ecosystem system called the Rehab Hub, where we integrate with 40 other companies plus 100 of our devices to create a full solution. I think instead, uh, we, have, we have a mini uh, Rehab Hub that comprises of quite a few of our system that actually relieve the burdens of clinicians trying to integrate technologies. So I think that helps the, the five major stakeholder groups to actually um, um, provide policies and support to embrace and accept technologies. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um, I mean, it, it does seem from everything that's been said that technology will play a major role, an absolutely fundamental role in tackling some of the issues and improving some of the outcomes we've touched on. 
Uh, Definitely. Sarah, th thoughts on that? I'd quite like to hear from Sarah and Jacko on that and the work that you do. Yeah, and I mean, just coming back to something that's sort of been said in terms of that education at the universities, you know, I, I think that's vital, actually. And I think that's something, you know, Liz, you're saying, you know, we've got to go back to the basics, go back to the start. I think you're completely right. And I think we've got to go back to our student days. You know, most of us around our table haven't been students for a long time. You know, I'm 20 plus years. I won't name exactly because it gives my age away. But I kind of, you know, it is that that's where we need to start, you know, then you, you point out about, you know, being a bit technical, you know, actually, you know, it's five years ago, I went to a conference, um, and I was very much, you know, you can't replace a therapist, you know, you've trained for years at university, you've gained all these skills from the acute trust to your rotations, you, know, you can't replace a therapist, you can't replace their hands, their skills, their knowledge. I went to um, a lecture and actually it was completely inspiring in terms of the outcomes that can be provided. And Liz, you know, you, you rightly point out it's the, the right opportunity for the right person at the right time with the right intensity. Um, and it's given those opportunities. So actually what we need to do is we need to increase those university spaces. We need to get more therapists trained. Um, you know, I'm talking from a therapy background, not a sort of a medical background as such, but, you know, because actually the, the, you're right, it is technology, it is robotic therapy, it is those functional opportunities, but we can't give them to patients if we don't have the staff to deliver it. Um, so obviously Chris Bryant is doing a lot of great work with UCBIF in terms of that ABI strategy, which is going to feed into all of this and give those, you know, that education, the opportunities. Um, and I think it is about that joint working. So then, you know, you, then you talk about your, um, you know, the, the rehab, we have hub, sorry, and you know those opportunities for people to work together. And I think you're right. I think it's not being so siloed. I think it's making sure that we do work together. We all have different opportunities. You know, at Aspen Rehab, we have the robotic, you know, opportunities as they do at Steps, as they do in different, you know, rehab units. And um, but it's working together a bit more because we're all quite siloed actually in those opportunities. Um, and, you know, we won't be right for everybody as steps won't be right for everybody as the other clinics won't be right for everybody. Um, you know, it's giving everybody that opportunity for the right place, that you know, and the pathways. Um, and Sanjeev, you pointed in, you know, earlier about the ICBs and the funding. Um, it is, I think you're right, it is that they're being so tied in regards to what they can offer for rehab pathways. You know, we're told very early on that somebody's going to be given eight weeks of funding. Um, but what happens actually if that person needs 16 weeks or 20 weeks? You know, we have to go into meeting after meeting to fight for more funding. Um, so that's taken me off the floor, actually. That's taken me off giving those people those opportunities. Um, and yes, I know, I do understand there's not, a, you know, a massive pot of money that, you know, can't be spent. And I do get that too. But it is giving people those opportunities to rehab at the right time and all the way through the pathway. If we are seeing changes five, 10 years down the line, it shouldn't just stop at 12 weeks. You know, there should be, you know, something for everybody, I think, really is, is the takeaway for me. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and Jacko, I, I'm going to ask all the panellists shortly for just a, a very brief sort of sound by, you know, uh, what you think the key priorities are moving ahead. But Jacko, if you'd maybe like to say a few words about the role of technology as you see it, and then uh, if we could start off with you, maybe then giving us your sense of what the priority should be, and then I'll work around the panel as we summarise. Yeah, I think I think um, uh, the role of technology in uh, in the future of stroke care or stroke rehabilitation, um, I think, is is very much in terms of uh, achieving some functional improvements for people who are living uh, with the aftermath of a stroke and their families. Um, so, those functional improvements, I think, is where where technology can uh, can help, and also in intensifying the rehabilitation. We know that the intensity that is necessary for rehabilitation to be uh, to be effective to get the right level of outcomes, that the intensity is so important. Um, the challenge with that is that uh, the cost of the uh, of the technology is often uh, inhibitive to uh, services adopting it. And the problem that I can see with that is that uh, as as a former healthcare uh, NHS manager and now as a as a as a business owner, is that the return of investment 
um, is not really seen as a return on investment uh, against uh, uh, the cost of society, but the return of investment is seen uh, within the budget of the rehabilitation service. So that is the budget of the staff or the budget of the technology or the maintenance of the building. And there, there isn't quickly going to be a return on uh, investment on a, on a poorly uh, budgeted uh, rehabilitation service that Liz already uh, identified. So I think that mindset uh, would need to change, that the return of investment is to society and it isn't to that particular service's staffing budget. Um, then uh, there, there is a risk in the, uh, in the development of technology and the early adopt adopting of technology is that it is not fully developed and not necessarily ready for market. Uh, engineers will come with beautiful ideas that are going to help people and, uh, and they have great potential to help people. But in order for it to be ready for market, it needs to be able to plug into the other rehabilitation technology and the other skill set that people have in the rehabilitation facility. So if you if you think of uh, of stroke rehabilitation as a as a bus or a car that's going on a journey, there is a lot of components that go into that vehicle, but there's also people in that vehicle that make it drive from A to B, and it is all those components, including the vehicle uh, that are included in the vehicle, but also the people who are driving the vehicle or the passengers who are on the journey. Everybody needs to be engaged into that target. Um, so I think that that is how I how I would like to see it and want to want to leave it that you know we're, we're on a bus on a journey, and we we all have to be uh, uh, be educated and trained, and facing in the right direction in order to make it a successful journey. Great, perfect. Thank you for that, Jacko. Uh, Sanjeev, final words on priorities from you. Yeah, I mean I would say uh, the priority should be funding, like I mentioned earlier. Um, Sorry, I'm just lost you. Um, there is you know, not enough funding at the moment. The way strokes are looked at when, I think Liz mentioned, when compared to heart attacks and uh, uh, you know other uh, emergency services is much different. Even though the effect from stroke treatment is much more effective than many of the other treatments. You know, the need to treat, if you look at from stroke, is around three for thrombectomy. I mean, when compared to need to treat for a PCI, is around 20, uh, 30. So it, the, there's a large, everybody knows that's one of the most uh, innovative and most pow powerful treatment which has now come up but still there is lack of funding for everything in stroke so i think the priority number one should be funding priority to number two would be like seeing how we can make sure that the isdn survive at the moment there's an issues about whether the very viability of isdns um, and whether they can have more funding by the icbs and you know a lot of other is issues where uh, which i mentioned earlier about people getting together to see how they can make things work from multiple areas and multiple expertise. So that's that's what I would say. Excellent. Thank you for that, Sanjeev. Uh, Zain, uh, final thoughts? Um, I agree with the speakers. You know, I, I think the future of stroke care stands at the intersection of compassion and technology. So it must be affordable. It must be um, easy to adopt. So we can use robotics and AI um, to revolutionize rehabilitation um, by providing personalized treatment plans, enabling like you know remote consultations, assisting stroke survivors to regain independence. So embracing opportunity opportunities such as um, continuous monitoring, monitoring, assistive robotics, VR, remote consultation can lead to transform transformative advancement in stroke care. Um, so, um, however, of course, the, the barriers will be user acceptance, as mentioned by some of the, the panelists, um, and the ethical consideration, the cost effectiveness, of, of course. Um, so these, these are all factors that are vital to unlock the full potential of using technologies in stroke we have. So um, I think through collaborative efforts, a shared vision, and unwavering determination, together we can overcome these challenges and build a future where stroke survivors can strive and reclaim their lives. Yeah. So let's embrace innovation, compassion, and the, the boundless possibilities and, and opportunities that lie ahead on redefining um, stroke care and unleashing the potential for robotics. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Zen. Uh, Sarah, uh, your priorities, final thoughts? Yeah, I think really it's about that funding. I think it's that funding to allow education, um, opportunities, and technology, because that is you can't have one of those doing well. It needs to be all three. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, and Liz, you get the final word. 
everyone, everyone said a lot of what I would agree are priorities. I think, I think, from my perspective, I think the the priorities, it, the focus does need to go back to um, uh, basics again. And as Sarah mentioned about education, I think is absolutely key. I think if you know education at university level is vitally important because we need an enthusiastic population of clinicians that want to work with stroke patients and want to offer the best possible um, care that they can for their patients, be that at the hyperacute level with the thrombectomy right down to neuro rehabilitation, but also, you know, the palliative care end as well. And it needs, to, and we need that. And I think we have got a body of passionate individuals but we need that we need more and also we need um us all to be sort of working together um uh, you know from from all the different specialties to to try to um really put stroke uh on the map um and i think i think we've all i think all of us in all of our specialties have, have been trying to do that but i think um as sarah said some of the work that chris bryant's been doing with the acquired brain injury has been has been really important and, and I think stroke needs to have that back in as well um, and, and I think you know we have got some amazing technologies and the advancements in stroke care have been phenomenal since I started uh, you know as, as a stroke consultant um, you know well nearly 25 years ago well 20, 20, you know, 20 over 20 years ago now and it's and it's a it's fantastic to see but there is this real lag and complete frustration that we have got therapies that we can offer our patients that will really improve the quality of life and get significantly better outcomes for many people. And it's and I think the only way that that will improve is by educating people at from the ground upwards, but also um, us as professionals that are working with stroke patients day in, day out for having a voice and having a voice within government and within policy. Um, because the only again, that's the only way we're going to get any funding, um, and 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 you know, education and enthusiasm basically, but also getting that research background to evidence what we're saying, and I think the research is there now. I think certainly, you know, again, when I first started in the York Stroke Research Network, one of the reasons that was formed was because the the it, delivering really robust research um, studies to get um, evidence based outcome that we could then take to you know government within rehabilitation has always been challenging and within stroke care has usually been challenging as well because of the the nature of stroke and the nature of patients being um you know every patient is different and they've, they've got so many different problems and symptoms and and presentations um despite you know a lot of brain scans being the same that person actually presents very differently doesn't don't they and and so getting robust high quality research um without good outcomes i think is really important and i think again we are there more we've got a research community that is is active you know there's reporting systems for all of all of the work that you know we're doing within the technology world and within the hyperacute world now it's just getting that message across and i think that's one of the challenges is actually how to do that um uh, and i think the only way that that's going to happen is through education and through bodies getting together and actually just talking and making a noise about it because we should be making a noise about it. You know, you know, when my granddad had his stroke, there wasn't anything other than aspirin and a bed and, and, you know, maybe a little bit of physiotherapy if you were lucky. Whereas now there is something and there's, there's a huge amount of, of stuff that can be done to radically reduce disability in patients. And, and as Sanjeev said, we've, we've, uh, you know, once you've seen somebody, you know, come in with a with a total anterior circulation stroke, you know, not being able to, to move their arm and the leg, not being able to speak, and then overnight after, you know, the hyperacute care and the thrombectomy, they then walk out that next day. That is that is actually miraculous. Um, and and it really, you know, and, and that isn't, you know, the fact that that's not funded is 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 a is a massive problem um and then the other then then the other aspects as well again further down the line with patients that have have got some level of disability again once you've seen what intensive rehab can do in, in using the technology and optimizing symptom control optimizing spasticity reducing pain um 
and then you see their functional and, and getting the right psychology, which again is massive problem um, lacking. But then actually, once you see the potential in these types of patients and, and what people can actually achieve with the right support and the right special specialist care, uh, again, you know, this, this is something that we should be shouting about because I think, you know, patients are being failed. But I think, you know, the fact that we have got all of these technologies coming through and all of the advancement in stroke care is really positive. It's just, you know, we need to get that to more patients. Um, Thanks, Liz. Uh, that's a really positive note on which to end uh, this discussion. I'd just like to take this opportunity on behalf of NR Times to say a big thank you to what has been a, a fabulous panel uh, for all their insight, for all your experience. Uh, and I think it's just been an incredibly passionate and informed and positive discussion. I think in our times, I hope, will go ahead uh, and work with not just the panellists, but the communities you're involved with to amplify some of these issues around education and awareness, technology, funding, collaboration. Uh, and I'm sure there are more uh, roundtable discussions where we'll focus on those things. To all those that are watching this, then please, you know, share this as widely as you can. This discussion uh, deserves to be shared widely, and I hope it will spark off further discussions. So on behalf of NR Times, thanks again to all our panellists, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.